Mahia Ear, and today I'll share my work with you on the timing and geography of adaptive Neanderthal introgression in modern humans. Um, so, especially in this session, we can appreciate that gene flow is a, can provide a really important source of genetic variation that natural selection can act on. Um, and so when hybrids back cross into a parental population, uh, natural selection can favor the spread of alleles that are newly introduced to that population, uh, and we call that adaptive introgression. And thanks to this process, um, snowshoe hares um, could camouflage with environments that are less snowy than that that shows than the environment shown here. Um, killifish, uh, a species of killifish, could adapt to extremely polluted waters, um, and Arabidopsis arenosa could inhabit these uh, really rocky, harsh serpentine soils. Uh, and then we also have examples of adaptive introgression in our own species. Um, and today I'm talking about Neanderthal adaptive introgression. So Neanderthals and modern humans diverged from each other about half a million years ago, after which Neanderthals moved into Eurasia uh, and adapted to colder climates, reduced UV exposure, and new pathogen pressures. About 50 to 60,000 years ago, a subset of the now modern humans migrated into Eurasia, and around the same time that they were encountering these new environments, they mated with Neanderthals, um, and we know that they borrowed some of these alleles from Neanderthals to adapt to similar conditions to what Neanderthals had been living in for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and so we've identified alleles that have adaptively introgressed from Neanderthals into modern humans, um, and that's because they're at unusually high frequency in present day modern human populations. Um, whereas in the rest of the genome, if you observe a Neanderthal allele that's segregating in the human population, it will be at uh, just a few percent for its frequency. Um, so what's really exciting is that we can use ancient samples uh, to actually observe the time course of adaptive introgression. Uh, so as indicated in this figure, there's over a thousand ancient genomes that have been sequenced, uh, and these are for modern humans. So we also have archaic genomes that are sequenced, but I'm focusing on modern human ancient genomes. Um, and most of those genomes uh, have been sampled from Europe, and so today I'll focus on the history of adaptive introgression in Europe. Um, and so what I wanted to do uh, with these time series data is to um, observe the change in allele frequency of the beneficial Neanderthal allele over time. So what I did is I took these ancient individuals in, uh, from Europe and grouped them into populations based on the time period that they were sampled. So here, on the vertical axis, uh, I'm ordering these populations over time from the past on the bottom to the present on the top above that black line. Um, so all these populations are from Europe, except of course for present day East Asians. Um, and on the bottom, on the x-axis, I just put a handful of gene regions in which we know that these alleles have adaptively progressed, um, thanks to work by Fernando Racimo and others. Um, so, what I'm going to show you is that for every gene region and population, I'm going to plot a point, and that point is going to tell us the average Neanderthal allele frequency in this gene region. Uh, if you see a green point, that means that there's less than 5% Neanderthal allele frequency on average, um, and the darker purple you observe, that means there's a higher uh, Neanderthal, average Neanderthal <coughs> allele frequency uh, in this gene region. It's like a 40 kV window. Okay, so I'm going to show you results. Oh. I also want to say that these genes are generally involved in innate immunity, skin pigmentation, muscle contraction, among some other potential functions. Uh, so I'm going to show you results for TA and C1. Uh, so the first, basically what I want you to notice is that up until our furthest um, sampling point in the past, uh, Neanderthal alleles seem to be at some moderate frequency in these populations. Um, and so potentially we think uh, it's possible that selection could have occurred shortly after admixture. So the Neanderthal allele was beneficial in modern human populations shortly after admixture. And so if we try to represent this on a tree that relates present day modern human populations and Neanderthals, uh, we might place selection along the branch um, that's the ancestor of Europeans and East Asians. So once again, shortly after admixture and the ancestor of Europeans and East Asians. Uh, so now I'm going to show you results for all of the other regions. Um, so the first thing that I want you to notice is that when we look at present day populations, I've selected regions in which we observe adaptive introgression in Europe, um, but we don't always observe adaptive introgression in East Asia. 
Um, so it's possible for those regions that selection must have occurred in Europe after uh, Europeans diverged from East Asians. Now something else that I want you to notice is that um, even if we observe adaptive introgression in Europeans and East Asians, if we look in the past, it appears that the Neanderthal allele um, didn't rise in frequency until much more recently. Um, so perhaps um, that means that there was selection um, that was independent in Europeans and East Asians. So there had to be, to be this intermediate neutrality period after, the, after which the Neanderthal allele became beneficial. Um, so if we look at uh, a bunch of, like if we look at some of the results here, we might see that there's a number of cases that um, in which the Neanderthal allele became beneficial only much more recently. And so it's possible that there was a change in the environment um, that caused that allele to become beneficial and it was not previously. Um, but something that I haven't shared with you is that around this time period, um, the Holocene was beginning, and this is marked by the end of the Ice Age. So Europe is warming up. There's a lot of migration into Europe and a lot of population turnover within Europe. Um, and so it's possible that instead of selection occurring within Europe, um, just like starting at this time period, there could be a population that was isolated from Europe for some time, that experienced selection and later migrated into Europe, which explains why we observe it at some intermediate frequency in the present day. In fact, we know that Europe uh, has three ancestral populations. One of them is the early farmers from the Middle East, uh, the steppe population from northeast of Europe, and uh, western hunter-gatherers that were living in Europe and were largely replaced with these migrations. Um, and so what I'm going to share with you today is a method that, that can incorporate this known demographic history with tests for selection. Uh, and we can do this by building on a framework introduced by Kristen Lee and Grant Coop, um, in which for each possible scenario, and each scenario is a case of selection in different populations, so different branches of the admixture graph that I've shown you, uh, we can estimate the composite likelihood of observed allele frequencies at loci around the selected site. And by looking at these loci around the selected site, we're basically looking at hitchhiking. And so um, we can get this probability distribution of allele frequencies under all of our models, uh, by writing out what the relatedness should be within and between populations at loci surrounding the selected site. Um, and we can do this by modeling the underlying coalescent process. So Kristen did this uh, for cases with really rare migration, and today I'm sharing with you um, the method that can incorporate much more complex admixture histories. So uh, I'm just going to show you, uh, give you a little intuition for how this works. Uh, so here I'm showing you an admixture graph that you've previously seen. And I'll just say that this does not incorporate the whole story. It's a more complex than this, but what we care about right now is um, the history of selection in Europeans, so this will be sufficient. Um, so I simulated, or we'll consider a case in which, of course, there's a mixture between Neanderthals and the ancestor of Europeans and East Asians, and that uh, this Neanderthal allele is going to be segregating at low frequency in all the populations until some time uh, somewhat more recently, in which it was beneficial in only the early farmers. Um, so it was selected in early farmers, after which the early farmers migrated into Europe. Um, so what we're interested in, what we're interested in is the probability that a pair of alleles that you sample in early farmers coalesce before the root of this tree that I'm showing you. Um, and so I'm going to show on the y-axis probability of coalescing and how that changes over the x-axis, which is the recombination distance from the selected site. Uh, so the selected site is on the left, and then we're going to move away from it. And what we can see is that the probability of coalescing um, is much greater uh, closer to the selected site, and that's because of the sweep. Um, and it's just going to decay to our neutral probability of coalescing. So similarly, we can look at the probability of coalescing between alleles sampled in early farmers and Neanderthals. And remember that the selected allele came from Neanderthals. Um, and similarly, we can see that uh, there's much greater coalescence closer to the selected site. So early farmers are going to look much more closely, going to look closer to the Neanderthal sequence closer to the selected site. Uh, and we can also look between a selected early farmer population and East Asians that did not experience selection. Um, so the Neanderthal allele is at very low frequency in East Asians, if it's segregating at all. 
Um, and we can see that closer to the selected site, uh, they're basically, their sequences are going to be much more different than we expect uh, in a neutral case. Okay, so just to remind you, uh, so we can model what these coalescent probabilities are going to be uh, for each scenario of adaptive introgression and get these composite likelihoods. And we have good power to distinguish between uh, these different potential scenarios. Um, and we can also um, estimate the position of the selected site and the selection coefficient. We have good power to do this. Um, so now I'm going to show you some results for, um, in which I ran the method just on modern populations. So I haven't included ancient populations yet. Um, and so I'm distinguishing between the following cases. First, in which, of course, there's admixture, but there's no selection on the Neanderthal allele. Second, in which there's independent selection in Europeans and East Asians. Um, so there has to be this intermediate neutrality period in which the Neanderthal allele is at low frequency. Um, or selection in the ancestor of Europeans and East Asians. And last, um, selection only in Europeans and not in East Asians. Okay, so now I'm showing you results for some genes that are involved in innate immunity, starting with OAS. So on the x-axis, I'm showing you the location of the selected site. Um, and this, is, um, this plot is basically showing you the profile likelihood surface um, for this uh, position of the selected site. And the y-axis is basically telling us the evidence in favor of a given model of selection relative to a model with no selection. So, um, uh, so these different, uh, maybe for time's sake, I won't walk through each of these, but basically you can see that all these models um, peak at the most likely selection coefficient. And what I would want you to notice is that um, the most likely model is that of um, independent sweeps. <coughs> uh, uh, gosh. Okay, yeah, independent sweeps in Europe and East Asia. So it seems like in this case it was independently beneficial in each of these populations after they slipped from each other. Okay, now I'm showing you a result for another gene involved in, wow, innate immunity. Um, <laughs> uh, we see the same thing, this independent selection case in both the populations. I'm just going to tell you the results. So I looked at BNC2, which is a skin pigmentation gene. Um, and what we find is that it's selection that only occurs in Europe, which is not very surprising because it's at very low frequency in East Asians. Um, but we might, oh great, and the selection coefficient is 0.5%. And I ran it, uh, this method with ancient uh, populations as well. And I distinguished between the selection, independent selection in all the ancient populations and selection in the ancestor of all the ancient populations. What we find is the case of um, in selection in the ancestor of all the ancient populations, but after they diverged from East Asia. So I shared with you today that we can use coalescent theory and mixture history to learn about the timing and geography of adaptive introgression. Uh, and what we're finding, and I'll say that this is preliminary, uh, but we're seeing that introgression is mostly uh, providing a reservoir extending variation that natural selection can act on, uh, rather than uh, being immediately adaptive. Uh, and I just want to give a quick plug to see Andrew Whitehead's talk. So um, he applied a similar framework to what I'm talking to you about today in uh, Killifish. Um, so go see that. And generally, this method is pretty flexible uh, and can be applied to a number of systems with complex demographic histories. Okay, thanks to the Coop Lab, and I'll take any questions at this time.